much. Um, so, Jason and Simukuzo, Thomas Galaboga, Rainish, Gomihal, Tamihal, and Sirhor at Crow Ireland. Um, and Michael is a chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor. So, um, Michael, you have a, a vast experience, I suppose, dealing with many clients, and you offer them a lot of advice and business advice and strategies on how to deal with not just tax and finance, but I suppose across many sectors now between the tourism and between food and beverage and international trading. So I'm sure you have plenty of stories and great experience. So we're looking forward to, to all the tips you can give us with Brexit coming up now. Okay. Grumahad Noreen, I guess Tamam we are congestion, Lord Liber Father Maiden, I guess Sulungamasha Simul. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you for joining me and for the opportunity and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a nice uh, interesting presentation this morning. Uh, I suppose for a business that's expanding and moving into new markets and moving overseas, it can be a very exciting time, but it can also present its own challenges and headaches, not least in the area of tax. And we're going to have a look at a couple of these this morning. I'm going to focus on four of them in particular where we have a VAT and customs, obviously always uh, an issue for, for doing business overseas. Uh, we have international tax and the changing environment. So uh, this is the whole area. You'd have heard a lot of talk in the media, I suppose, recently about um, changes to you know, uh, in, in international tax agreements and so on and how, tax, how profits are going to be taxed. So we look at that. Following on from that and very much linked to it is the type of structures that you might put in place if you are trading internationally and the challenges that they would give rise to. And finally, global mobility, because I suppose any business that's trading internationally is likely to find itself um, you know, uh, seconding employees abroad, and in some cases, welcoming employees into Ireland from abroad. And that gives rise to, to tax challenges as well. Now, if we start then with the whole area of- I just don't see your presentation customs. there. Oh, um, okay, Mike, sorry, yeah. uh, Okay. Um, so if I can- Just normally takes a minute or two for it to come up. Yeah, okay, one second there. No. Yeah, something's happening. Perfect. Yeah, you can Excellent. go large even if it's easier for Sorry, you. Yeah, not. that's okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So we'll start off then with the whole area of VAT and customs. And I think when people mention trading overseas, this is instinctively the first thing that most people think of the whole area of customs. And we, we see that at the moment in the, with the Brexit debate, and uh, we'll come to that in a minute, where people straight away focus on the area of, of, well, will we have tariffs to pay or will there be tariffs on our products? Uh, and of course, that's an obvious thing to look at because that's what will increase the cost of our, of our goods um, for, for our customers or in some cases for ourselves, increase our raw material costs and so on. Um, but when you're looking at customs, there's actually two sides to the coin. There's, there is, of course, the tariffs, but on the other side, we have the whole customs procedures and, and, and requirements that have to be met. And they apply uh, e even if you don't have a tariff. That's relevant at the moment with Brexit, where even if we get a zero tariff agreement, we will still have to go through various procedures. So there is the two sides to the coin there with, with customs. And also when you're looking at customs, you should never forget the terrible twin VAT. The two nearly have to be considered uh, side by side. So when you're looking then at exporting, uh, the big issue is really when you're, for customs particularly, is when you're exporting outside the EU. Uh, and the challenges that would arise on the tariff side, it's classifying your products because different products have different tariffs. And this is quite a complex area because you might have two products from what we might call the same family, very similar, but subtle differences. And there could be a completely different classification and a radically different rate of tariff applicable to the two of them. So that's one of your first challenges that you get the, the product classification right. You'll also find yourselves in terms of procedures then using say customs agents, which would typically be the big international uh, transportation or courier companies. Uh, so liaising with them and ensuring that the, the correct documentation is filed and so on. Uh, in turn, then also are a, a real favorite inco terms, which is actually agreeing your terms essentially with your customers. And we'll have a more detailed look at that in a minute. And then when you've finished with customs, you move on to, as I said, the, the terrible twin VAT and, and what you need to consider there. So on the customs area, since 1993 EU single market, it's fantastic. You can pretty much move freely goods and services across the EU and 
you don't typically worry about customs and even the VAT, as we'll see in a minute, is, is relatively a relatively friendly regime. But for outside the EU, you will have to consider customs and tariffs. Now, you would all probably have heard over the last year or two in the context of Brexit, people saying, well, make sure you apply for your, your EORI number. This is like your passport. It's like your identification number. And it'll be used to deal with and interact with customs authorities across the EU. So the reason it's relevant for Brexit is that with the, e, with the UK leaving the European Union, it will now be regarded as an export in and out of the EU effectively. So you'll be dealing with cu customs there. So that's why they say people who maybe are dealing maybe don't have huge exporting experience, but who have a UK uh, customer base, the, 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 or, the ORI number becomes relevant. But leaving aside the tariffs themselves, the, the, the whole area of procedures com comes into this as well. And between yourself and your customer, you need to agree who's going to be responsible, not alone for, the, for meeting customs requirements and, and payment of tariffs, but also some of the other um, aspects that would arise. For example, who's going to be responsible for, for transportation and meeting the transportation costs? What about insuring the goods um, and so on, in addition to the customs and tariffs? And the International Chamber of Commerce have, have set out a number of what we call INCO terms. There are six or seven of them there that set out the responsibility for each side, for each party. Now, at either end of the spectrum, we have we have X works in co terms. So these are a particular favorite of the person who's selling, because it essentially says that you agree those in co terms with your customer. It means that from the minute the goods leave your factory, it's it's the purchaser's responsibility to look after to make sure they're transported, that the costs are paid, that the tariffs are paid, and that the customs procedures are are, are dealt with. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the the one that the buyer loves, which is delivery duty paid, which means that up and until they land at the customer's premises, essentially, or the final destination, the responsibility for all of that rests with the seller. And then you obviously have a number of other inco terms that are kind of in, fall in between those two extremes. But that's an important area because, um, you know, obviously movement of goods in addition to customs and, 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 and customs and VAT and so on, you would also have just the usual stuff like the, the actual, the, the administrative arrangements, transportation, insurance, and so on. So that's a critical area for anybody who's exporting to familiarize yourself with that whole area of inco terms. Um, as well as the area, uh, more, the, more directly the area of customs and the types of declarations that, that you'll have to make. Uh, when we look at VAT then, which has to be considered in tandem, I think when you're exporting goods and services, your big concern from a VAT point of view is to try and minimize the minimize compliance and particularly to minimize the number of countries where you have to be registered for VAT. And thankfully within the European Union, that's quite a streamlined process now, and it's becoming more streamlined. So as a general rule, if you're selling business to business, so you're selling to a, to a VAT registered business in another EU member state, that is normally quite straightforward, provided you meet certain invoicing requirements, uh, you should be able to zero rate that, zero Irish VAT, and they will look after the German or French or Dutch or Spanish or whatever it may be, VAT themselves. So that's nice and streamlined. If it's business to consumers, so you're selling to private customers, the traditional position there in most cases was that you charged Irish VAT. So again, that was a quite straightforward process. You're just using your own VAT regime. There are exceptions, though, uh, particularly in the area of goods, uh, but also in ca some cases services. So when you're selling goods to, and this is the dangerous one, when you're selling goods to private customers, so non-business customers, so ordinary consumers, in other EU member states, on first principles, it's Irish VAT you charge. But once you go above a certain level of sales to those private customers in their country, you have an obligation to register for VAT in that country and apply that VAT. In most, it's either there's a threshold for it, and in, it's either 35,000 or 100,000. Most countries in Europe, have the, including Ireland, have a threshold of 35. I think there are four countries, Holland, Germany, Italy, and Luxembourg, that have the 100,000 threshold. But the point is that if you're selling into, for example, into Spain to private customers, and you suddenly find that you're selling more than 35,000 in, in a given year, you have to register and apply Spanish VAT. Okay. The second exception is for services that are digitally supplied. There's a special regime brought into that, brought in for that in 2015, and this is very much the future. It means that when you're supplying digital services to private customers, you have to register in, 
in each country that you're supplying them. Now, as you can imagine, if digitally su supplied services, you can have people logging in from all over Europe. So could you, you could find yourself registering in 27 different countries. But thankfully, the EU brought in a system I will call a common sense system, MOS, mini one-stop shop, which means that if you're supplying digital services, you register for this central portal. And instead of registering for VAT in 27 different countries, you file quarterly returns on MOS, declaring what you sold in what country, and it calculates the VAT for you in each country and you pay it over through that system. And I said that is the future. And the reason I say that is that from next July, 1st of July 2021, most business to customer services and also the goods that are currently distant sales will fall into the one-stop shop. So from July 2021, if you're doing any sort of sales of goods to business customers with no threshold anymore across Europe, other EU member states, or most services to private customers, you'll go through that one-stop shop. So in summary, from next July onwards, you'll either be, be zero rating your VAT and letting your business customer deal with it yourself, or if it's a, a private customer, business consumer, you will find yourself availing um, of this uh, central portal, effectively, the one-stop shop. Okay, so it'll be nice and streamlined. Um, so when you go outside the EU, then the good news there is obviously you won't be applying VAT because VAT is very much uh, an EU tax. Uh, I know they have kind of similar schemes in, in America with sales tax and indeed in Australia, very similar to VAT. But the point is it's, it's not our VAT uh, system. So generally when you're supplying outside the EU for goods, you'll be zero rating them. You won't be charging Irish VAT. And for services, it depends what the service is, but it's, it's normally... Normally, you do have to charge Irish VAT on services unless they're professional services, um, which are generally uh, uh, zero rated. Um, and I suppose where that last point about selling outside the EU becomes relevant is our, our favourite topic with, with only a couple of weeks ago, Brexit. And Kerda Harlos going a couple of shots. And what will happen here is the simplest way to put it is this. From 1 January 2021, the UK are more precisely Great Britain will be treated in the exact same way as the United States, China, Australia, Azerbaijan, or whatever country you might want to think, that it'll be outside the EU. And so if you're selling goods or services to the United Kingdom, you will, to the Great Britain rather, you will be deemed to be selling them outside the EU. So all those customs procedures and EORI and the SADS declarations and the ENCO terms and so on will, will be on the radar. For, for selling goods across to Great Britain. And you will also have the VAT treatment, which will generally mean you'll be zero rating it in most cases, uh, other than certain services. Uh, and the UK customer will have to deal with the U whatever UK VAT regime they'll have themselves. Uh, so in some senses, it's, it's straightforward in that if you're already exporting to places like America and China, this will be just another one to add to the list. Obviously, if you're not, it'll be a new experience for you. But there are, uh, but at the same time, it's relatively straightforward. Where are the, where the uncertainties arise? There are two, and hopefully we'll get a resolution to these in the next couple of days. The first one is we don't know if there'll be tariffs applied between Ireland between EU and UK. Uh, depends on the free trade agreement that that might be struck. Uh, but remember, even if there is a zero tariff, you'll still have to go through the procedures at customs. So things are going to change. The second uncertainty is is great is the Northern Ireland. The good news is that under the withdrawal agreement, uh, transactions between Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland unchanged. Northern Ireland will be deemed to be in the EU effectively for, the, for VAT and customs purposes. So nothing should change in that regard. And even better news is that even Boris Johnson isn't disputing that part. Where he is disputing is the transaction between Northern Ireland and Great Britain because the EU regards that as outside the EU and to inside the EU, whilst he doesn't. So that's the second uncertainty that would need to be resolved. But that's a particularly maybe niche area for anyone who's, who's exporting to and from uh, Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain. So uh, an, an interesting area for, for, for Brexit and certainly something to, to be prepared for. Um, now, moving away from VAT and customs and looking at the global tax environment and the changes here. So you'd all probably be at least vaguely familiar from the media that there are a lot of changes happening in corporation tax. And there's been a lot of commentary about what this means for Ireland, our 12.5% rate, or maybe more particularly uh, what it means for the amount of corporation tax that we can collect. And what you may or may not be aware of is that in the last year or two, 
there have already been very significant changes brought into brought into Irish law to, to reflect some of these changes with more to come. Uh, I don't propose to have a lecture today on this area because it's, to say the least, it's highly technical uh, and we could speak for hours about it, but like we've had, you'd have heard of things like the BEPS project, the multilateral instrument, which is now relevant beside double tax treaties, certain rules to counter schemes where um, payments are moving between jurisdictions and transfer pricing rules as well. They're, they might actually be quite relevant. Just a quick word on transfer pricing. This is where you have transactions between connected companies or connected parties, and there are provisions there to make sure that they're at market value. That's becoming more relevant for SMEs now than it used to be. It used to be big companies, but it's now relevant for the SME sector going forward. In a general sense, what these rules are trying to do is they're trying to tackle a case where there's an artificial shifting of profits from one country into another country with a lower tax rate. And it's deemed to ensure a level playing field in this regard. For, for the people on this presentation today, I think the most relevant change in this area, and when we speak about briefly now, is permanent establishments, what that means and how that's changing. So a permanent establishment in simple terms, this is an age old concept and you'll see it in double tax treaties and so on. What it's designed, what it means is that it's the second most important thing probably in determining tax exposure for a company or a business behind tax residence. And it means essentially that a company from or a business from one country that sets up an operation of some description in another country reaches the point where they have a substantial enough presence in the other country to have to pay corporation tax there as well. That's the simple way of summarizing it. And uh, the, the practical implications when you reach the point that you have that presence or that base in the other country is it means typically you have to register for taxes and start applying tax rules over there, so an administrative burden, you'll typically have to pay corporation tax and the profits attributable to that to that base in that country. And it can also impact on your obligation to apply payroll taxes for any employees you might have over there, as, as we'll see in a few minutes. Traditionally, a permanent establishment was in place if you, one of two things, you either had a physical presence, a fixed place of business, as they call it, so factories, workshops, offices, building sites, and so on. In some extreme cases, even a business that had somebody working out of a bedroom in another country because of the nature of what was being, services being provided was deemed to have a permanent establishment. So it was strict enough already. Um, secondly, if you had agents, so typically employees or people closely connected with the company who were able to bind you, to sign binding contracts on your behalf in that other country, that created a permanent establishment. That's particularly important in some of the high profile cases we've seen involving Irish corporation tax, where the big issue is, where are they concluding their contracts? And some of the multinationals have a base in Ireland where they're concluding their contracts from here, and therefore they're bringing their profits in within the scope of the Irish 12.5 rate. So that's, that's, that's one. So essentially boots on the ground are or some kind of a, a, a physical presence generally got meant you had a PE. But even within those strict definitions, there were ways out of it under double tax treaties and so on. And this is where there was a feeling that there was maybe abuse going on and artificial shifting of profits. So recently they've started tightening Four up this less, whole area. Okay. They've started tightening up the area so that now really, if you have any sort of staff presence or if you have goods or stock or warehouses in the other country, you should consider this. Uh, tying that in with the structures is an important point because, again, do you set up, do you make that permanent service? Do you have a branch there or do you go for a subsidiary? And if you're being taxed in both countries under each structure, how do you get a credit in Ireland for the foreign tax structures it's suffered? If you're in an EU country or in a country with whom you're double taxed, that treaty, that should be achievable. But it's probably the most complex area you look at, the whole repatriation of profits withholding taxes come into this as well. And in certain countries, you might have a certain, like Asia, you have unusual withholding taxes, not just on interest and dividends, but on sometimes on your actual sales. My last point, probably global mobility, an important point. So if you have a presence and it's, it can be linked to the permanent establishment, people assume, well, if I'm not going to be resident in the other country, I won't have to pay tax there. And if I'm not there for 183 days, I'm not resident. Not so straightforward. If you're actually employed over there, you're carrying on more than incidental duties. And typically that can mean if you're over there for more than 60 days, or in the case of a permanent establishment, normally it's only 30 days, you'd actually be subject to employment taxes over in that country. And furthermore, for the employer, they, they, even though the employee might ultimately get a refund of the tax, the bar for having to withhold payroll taxes is even lower. 
So you could have a situation where you're having to run two payrolls for employees that you've seconded, and then the employee is trying to get a double tax credit. And finally, an important point, PRSI or national insurance. This is even more um, technical or even more um, tricky, I suppose, because you could have a situation where you're sending somebody abroad for a few years. They might be totally overseas tax, no Irish tax anymore, but you might find that because you intend to bring them back, you still have to apply Irish PRSI rather than foreign social security. But of course, at some point, it'll cross, you'll cross the Rubicon and it'll be overseas social security. And where that causes a difficulty for the employee to make sure that, they're, you know, that they get their social security coverage, so for any benefits they'll claim, but also for you as an employer, because remember, typically social security or social insurance rates are much higher in, in continental Europe than they are in Ireland. And this is an area that's very strictly monitored. And we've seen clients run into all sorts of difficulty in the past. So it's, it's an area to look at. And thankfully, the Department of Social Protection have a specialist unit down in Port Laurier, down in Waterford, to deal with this, to help you all out. So plenty to think about there. Nartilis, I guess, 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 I I Couple of the swings of bugger we had in Chengahore, it's looking at the Moss app. I think if we yeah. could all just register, look at it, um, and that would save a lot of issues in relation to that if it can all be done on a one stop shop. So thank you for sharing all that valuable information. I suppose all the best lay pans and with protocols changing all the time, it's fair to say that we probably won't have everything organized when we do decide to start trading um, and I suppose just if you were to leave us with one piece of advice that you know if you're a company that's after sending product out to the UK and all of a sudden you get that dreaded phone call that it's been stopped um, and we know once it's left at the border um, or at the, the port we're automatically going to start incurring some extra costs I suppose what advice will you give to our own clients and those on the call today just how would you go about tackling that phone call so that as you said don't panic and what stages yeah. would take? Yeah, so I suppose the first point to bear in mind there, that's where the EORI number comes into, into place. And if, you've, if you have that number, that problem will be greatly streamlined because you'll be able to interact with this. So the very first thing to do, and Revenue and Fairness are quite efficient at issuing these, is to get in touch with the Revenue Customs Branch and get that number issued. Um, mm -hmm. At that point then, I suppose your next your next issue is your your obviously to talk to your customs agent. Have you have you appointed one, um, and and to ensure that that kind of that you've provided the relevant information to them so that they can make the the, the declarations. But the very first port of call there would would be the would be the, the customs branch and revenue. Brilliant, yeah, yeah. brilliant, fantastic. Um, thanks very much. It's very exciting and it's constantly changing. Um, so you've given us great insight um, and. Again, if you have any questions, 